An event loop is a programming idiom for creating structures that can handle real-time events with low latency. We're going to look at this in the context of a specific piece of example code, the rock, paper, scissors sketch that appears on the course site. And at the top of the sketch is a sample circuit in Tinkercad, which is the hardware that supports the sketch with three push buttons and two servos and a speaker. But the key right now is to think more about the kind of programming structures that make this possible. Um, so scrolling down the page, we spend a lot of time now just scrolling back and forth in the code and trying to call out different pieces of things. I invite you to kind of open this up and take a look. So we're going to drop right down to the main loop and look at a couple of ideas. The main idea is the loop in the program is a cycle that runs at a high rate. And on every cycle, it has some way of checking for whether time has elapsed or an input is triggered, any sort of event that might happen and events that come from the outside world uh, may be asynchronous, like a button push, or events that come from internally, like the time elapsing, um, are treated as an asynchronous idea. So all of these things can happen at any time, and the idea is always be ready to process them when the time comes about. And what we'll see is that this requires turning the program inside out into an explicit state machine, which we'll cover separately. But just to get, cover the idea of the event loop, here we have loop, and the idea is loop is going to be re-entered as often as possible. So the first order of business, in some sense, is to keep track of time. There's a, 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 a variable last update clock that holds the previous timestamp, and then the new timestamp is read from the hardware millisecond clock. So with some arithmetic, we can, we can deduce how long has elapsed since the last iteration, whether that's simply zero milliseconds if it happened very recently, or perhaps a few tens of milliseconds if some things, things have happened. So this structure allows for a variable duration of, of execution inside the loop, and yet the clock will still be used as the timing reference to produce accurate times. The next thing that happens is basically a series of polling operations. This is one kind of event loop that has just explicit polling on every cycle. For in other kinds of systems, like in applications programming on desktops, event loops are used quite a bit to handle uh, asynchronous events like window system events and networking traffic, so things like that. But often there's more elaborate data structures provided to create efficient queues and efficient storage schemes for organizing the events just for faster processing. But with this amount of I.O., it's actually purely fine just to, to pull every device and every cycle and to see what the state looks like. So a couple of things here. There's always there's a lot of timer variables in this program which keep track of times that are counting down. And the particular style here is that the timer variables are denoted in milliseconds, and they're always counting down from some number. And when they become negative, they go less than zero, then the, the time has elapsed, or maybe even a little extra time. So here's a case where we take the game timer, and every cycle we compute how much time has elapsed, and then that interval value is subtracted from the game timer. So whatever the game timer happens to be timing, some particular phase or subcycle of, of the game engine, um, that will advance it a little bit more toward that timer expiring. The next little bit here is we read a random number. Um, games like this that depend on random input, it's, uh, it's a pseudo-random generator that uh, will produce a fixed sequence of numbers arbitrarily chosen, but a fixed sequence. So by running the random number generator in between uh, asynchronous events like user input, we do help to guarantee we're sampling from different parts of the cycle and get a, a more random outcome as a result. Um, we next see a kind of update here. Uh, this is actually for the melody player, which plays the tone sequences. And this is kind of a bit where uh, there is some condition, like if the melody count is active, if it's greater than or equal to zero, then the melody timer is considered to be active, like the game timer and interval is subtracted from melody timer to see when it expires. When it does expire, when melody timer is less than zero, the melody timer is reset for the next note duration, and then a function play next note is called. And so that function is structured so that at any moment it can uh, receive execution and uh, choose the next note in the current note cycle based on global variables. It's a kind of simple state machine to play notes. What we see here effectively inside the event loop is there's a polling step where the, the status is checked to see if it should run, the timer is checked to see if it should run, only if those conditions are met, then it updates and does something and comes back. The total execution time of these few lines of code is, is minuscule. It's just checking a few variables, perhaps updating the tone output once in a while, and then immediately returning. And so there's never a delay, and code is, the code is, execution is always advancing as fast as possible. Next, we see um, some logic for reading the input. Um, the switches are just simply always read every time, uh, as even if there's no other sort of process ready to receive the switch, 
um, just because it's simpler. It also opens the door to various kinds of filtering. Uh, Tinkercad switches are perfect and they don't bounce, but hardware switches can have multiple triggers or kind of, uh, you know, subtly bad contacts. So sometimes additional filtering could be implemented. In this case, we simply read the three switches. Um, you'll note that the, the, the exclamation point before the digital read uh, is applying the active logic of the input. These switches have a pull-up resistor, so when they're pressed, the input goes low. Digital read returns a true or false value. The, the um, exclamation point is a Boolean not, so a, a unpressed switch will be floating high, and that makes it low to be a false. So rock pressed, scissors pressed, and paper pressed end up being true or false values, which are true when that switch is pressed. There's a bit of logic then to sort of deduce, uh, to reject multiple contacts. And it's just coded out uh, as a set of logic operations. If rock is pressed and scissors is not pressed and paper is not pressed, then we can definitively say that the user input was rock. Um, in the case that multiple switches are pressed, it'll just default to as if no switches were pressed. And then that generates this value of user input state, which is always generated on every cycle, but then is available for use by further code. So after that, we get into the sort of game state machine. And I'll come back to this and discuss this separately. But the key idea is there's never a delay statement. Everything always runs at full rate. So the, um, on every cycle, there's some uh, consult, you know, the clock is checked to see how much time has elapsed. Various kinds of timer interval variables can be updated. Um, certain processes can run, possibly conditioned by the clock, possibly every cycle. And that allows the program to run continuously. And then as events happen, as buttons are pushed, as timers elapse, um, then other logic can be triggered to run in those cycles. It turns out because this is running in Tinkercad, at the very end of the loop, there actually is a very short delay um, with the idea basically that Tinkercad has the limitations as the simulator and we add a short delay just to not overwhelm the simulator. On a real Arduino, you could leave that out. It would just run even faster. In terms of actual execution time, I haven't measured this, but I would not be surprised if this like cycle here runs multi many times per millisecond. And just there's a, the cycles to, for this kind of computation, there are cycles to burn on an Arduino. Um, but the code is written to be flexible to allow other things to happen. As often is the case, the slowest operations here are um, the printing statements, because the characters only go out to the serial port at about 10,000 characters per second. And that is uh, probably the slowest overall kind of process that's happening compared to all the digital outputs. So it's a quick summary of, of the basic structure of the program organized around an event loop, which uh, tries to run as fast as possible. Uh, it uses sort of explicit state variables to describe what the status of the whole system is. And then every cycle can basically um, reevaluate a set of rules to decide how to advance that state to the next, um, the next moment in time. And this is a flexible structure that allows for simultaneous input and output in, on different pieces of hardware and is a great foundation for building kind of a general purpose real-time program.